Chapter 9. Rebellion. Commotion at the docks broke Gregor's concentration. The elegant script with long serifs slipped out of focus, and his eyes drifted towards the window. He had resolved to remain seated, to turn back to his folios, when a man's panicked scream, followed by what sounded like war cries, confirmed to him that something was truly amiss. The window sill was cold to the touch, and so was the sea breeze in his face, but neither registered long in his consciousness once he saw the battle unfolding quayside. Disheveled, bedraggled men surged up and out of the hold of the ship at port. Slaves, Gregor reckoned, the newest shipment that they had procured to work on the castle Draustrom's crumbling seawall, but somehow they had freed themselves, and neither the crew nor Gregor's own servants were able to stop them. A rebellion on the quay, a gravelly voice said from behind him. Gregor hid his displeasure at Felix's unannounced arrival. Gregor was the titular ruler of Draustrom, and by extension, all of the servwar, but Felix still felt free to sneak up on him, and, Gregor suspected, check up on him regularly. Gregor didn't like it, but, as always, he was careful how he played out his hand. After all, his role called for a maturity beyond his years. The guards look reluctant to interfere, Gregor said, noticing how the servor fighters, men selected for their cruelty and brawn to be the muscle of the order, remained on the battlements. I imagine they await orders before they abandon their posts and join the fray. Reluctant they would be to harm slaves, as they would likely take their places on the seawall if we run short of workers. We can send some of our students, then, to quell the fight. It might be good practice, Gregor said, trying to sound bold, decisive, and hiding the speculative nature of his statement. We could, sir. Do you think they are up to it? Not if you just questioned it. Gregor was growing impatient. His attention locked onto one slave in particular, a young man, pale and emaciated, who had fallen down on the deck, shaking in a sort of fit. Another older slave bent over to try to attend to him, while the others continued their revolt. The chaos was growing and ran the risk of spreading. Gregor saw two guards struggling to close the doors on the gate between the bailey and the docks, while slaves, swinging their chains as weapons, approached. All order might be lost if the slaves infiltrated the castle. Gregor reached out with his power, extending his consciousness around the doors the way vines might creep along their lengths and edges. Once he held them firmly in his mind's grasp, he slammed them shut and locked them with a final flourish of his hand. The guards who had been leaning against the doors lost their footing and fell into the mud. Gregor had half a mind to go down and spell the slaves into submission himself, even if the cruelty of it unnerved him. Well done, my lord. Will you go down to stop the rebellion yourself? Again, Felix showed an uncanny ability to guess his innermost thoughts. If for no other reason than to be contrary, Gregor turned on his heel and walked away at a swift clip. No, I will call upon the Revenant. A phantom of that statue should keep them in line for years to come. A wise choice, my lord, Felix said. Damn you, Felix. Damn you. The Revenant waited in repose in a chamber that only Gregor was allowed to enter. It was in the far northwest tower of the castle, the entire wing of which was off limits to all but he. However, he suspected some of the lower-ranking servors, Felix's spies, snooped through some of the hidden passageways. Yet none of them knew the castle's secrets like he. None of them had grown up in the place, and none of them had the freedom to explore castle and grounds as he had. It was difficult to tell where the rocks and cliffs ended and the fortress began, its own steep walls, imposing battlements, cut from the same gray-black stone of the isle. Drowstrom offered a sinister face to the world on an unforgiving crag, the shoals of which had been the graveyard for many a ship. Dig in the shingle of the shore, and one would find bones, it was said. 
With the commotion at the quayside and lessons in session for the students, Gregor was confident he was alone, so he broke into a less than dignified run down the corridor to his private study. He entered through a heavy iron door that opened not with a key but with spells that he snapped out with a flash of his flattened palm. Then he climbed a stairwell that wound up into the highest chamber of the tower. The shutters were fastened closed, and the room was lost in gloom except for the merest cracks of light outlining the windows. This high up, it was impossible to keep out the wind that churned over the sea and piled storm clouds into the great thunderhead that poured down daily on the isle. But the revenant did not need light nor warmth, and it required only the barest sustenance, as it was a body, in this case, one of the champion soldiers who had volunteered for the honor, but mostly dead now. The consciousness of that man was gone. Gregor could see the shape, wrapped in the blue cloak that appeared dark as ink in the shadows. He closed the door behind him with his will, took a knee, and bowed his head. At the same time, he reached out with his consciousness towards the seated figure, concentrating on the blue stone clasped in a band around the neck. It was just a jewel to others, but he knew the moonstone to be a portal into his master's mind, who was distant, in a land that even Gregor did not know. Master, hear me. Your servant Gregor calls you. He repeated the plea in his mind a dozen times, before the lids of the revenant cracked open with a sound like paper folding. Slits of blue stared out at him from beneath the hood. Speak. The dead lips moved. My master, an insurrection is ongoing. A ship of slaves has broken loose, fifty or so. Well within your power to pacify, my student. Yes, but I thought the Revenant's appearance would intimidate them into a deeper submission. More than just a boy, King. Y yes my master. He felt a ripple of displeasure. How he felt it he was not sure, as the Revenant did not betray any movement or affect. The face itself was stiff and dry, but somehow, in their communication, he could sense his master's moods even catch flashes of where he was. Not that Gregor could ever piece the images together, the long shorelines, the tall city walls and even taller towers, the forest of masts clustered in a harbor. They looked like no place he had ever known. All he had ever known was Drowstrom, and of course that one memory of a sun-drenched hill, grass bending in the sea breeze, the receding shape of his family's hut, a blue sky, empty of clouds, and so he knew that there had to be more to the world than this rocky isle and its brooding fortress. But if he would ever see it, he knew not. If you are to convince them you are truly Gregor Twiceborn, he who conquered death and was reincarnated, you must act like it. His master spoke through the dry, husky voice of the corpse. Yes, master. Yet, yet I did not want to run the risk of failure. Felix, I fear, grows suspicious. We will deal with him in time, his master said, the corpse rising, its joints cracking as it moved towards the doorway, the smell of rot enveloping Gregor as it passed. For now... I shall see to the slaves. Felix should at least believe that the Revenant is obedient to you. He followed in the wake of the reanimated thing, its musculature coming to life, the stiffness in its joints lessening with each creaking step. Soon they swept into the halls of the keep, where novices in training knelt down when they passed. They always knelt down for Gregor Twiceborn. He was their lord and master, but now there was an extra frisson of fear at the sight of the revenant, its flowing blue cloak, those glowing eyes that were empty and full all at once. The warrior had been intimidating in life. In death, he was a horror. 
smoke was rising from the quay as Gregor and the Revenant made their way onto the lower walls of the castle that overlooked the shore. The soldiers who had gathered on the battlement parted for them. To all who witnessed, it appeared that the Revenant followed Gregor, at his whim, an illusion he and his master conspired to keep. The servor looked at him not as a child, but as a man reborn, who could control life and death. Gregor stopped along a balustrade and reached out for one of the soldier's spears. No sooner had he than the soldier surrendered his weapon. Gregor placed it in the hands of the revenant. With a fluttering of his robes, the warrior's corpse leapt down the height of the castle walls to the ground, landing next to the fire of wheelbarrows and barrels that the slaves had kindled at the doors of the gate. Gregor half expected his master to turn the flames against them, but that would have been a waste of their able bodies. His master knew how much they needed to repair the crumbling castle. Instead, he cast a binding spell on their legs, freezing those nearest him in place. He knocked them over with ease, using the blunt end of his spear. The slaves still on the ship gathered at the gangway, ready to do battle. Gregor could see a few trying to flee, leaping into the water to swim for the shore. They would be sorely disappointed to find that they were on an island, he thought to himself. Again he noticed the same young man lying as if dead on the deck of the slaver. His master boarded the slave ship without hesitation. Here he indulged himself, clashing with the arms of the rebels, meeting their strikes and thrusts, parrying their attacks and casting the men to the side, knocking them into the water or against the gunwale. He must have soon realized there was little challenge with this lot, and, as if growing impatient, he enchanted the weapons of the men, chains, stolen swords, maces, and axes, so that they grew red-hot. The men dropped them, smoking to the deck. Then, with a sweep of the revenant's arm, he sent them tumbling over one another, pushed by an invisible force, until they were crowded like goats in a pen at the stern of the ship. He bound their limbs as well, and they struggled, working against the paralysis, their faces betraying their fear and confusion. The dry, gravelly voice of the revenant spoke. Who is your leader? A good question, Gregor thought. They had to have one. The men betrayed him with their eyes, all looking to a man with a blond beard and a defiant stare. He stumbled forward, the binding spell loosed unexpectedly. He was brave, for he stood tall, his shoulders thrown back, his chin high. What is your name? His master asked. Jekyll, he said, and I'll not surrender to no demon like you. Jacko took full advantage of his freedom and lunged for the revenant, swinging a studded mace. The revenant stepped aside, and in the same motion, he summoned a sword to his hand from one of the frozen slaves. Jacko redoubled his attack, but it was short-lived. The revenant parried his next charge off to the side and caught Jacko by his long hair. The sword came down in a silver blur, and in an instant, the deck was sprayed in blood. Both Jacko's hands lay severed on the boards. Jacko dropped to the ground, his mouth agape a scream yet to emerge. He stared at his own bloody stumps, cowering as the revenant stepped closer, anticipating a more fatal blow. It did not come. It wouldn't, Gregor knew. Jacko would be spared, to be an example. The revenant spoke. The same fate waits for any other man who attempts insurrection. Work diligently, and you can earn your freedom. Now, who still dares to challenge the servoir and Gregor the Twice-Born? No man moved. The doors of the gate opened, and the servoir soldiers poured forth to restore order and dispose of the bodies of the dead slavers. His master's work done, Gregor moved the revenant towards the port side of the ship, where the corpse knelt down beside the prone young boy, lifted his head by the hair, looked into his face, then released him. The sound of his head hitting the deck 
echoing off the castle walls. Curious, Gregor thought. He turned to the sergeant on his right. Bring that slave to me, if he is still alive. Chapter 10 Homeward The mountain wind cut through Caitlin's clothes and ground through her flesh as she sat on the bluffs looking to the southeast. That was the direction Adamantus and Gale had gone days before, following a rumor that another Rachne had been spotted. Adamantus still wanted answers. Gale wanted revenge, a respect having grown between the two of them and their shared target, if not shared goal. Caitlin had felt left out and had not liked it. Why can't I come? she had asked. It's too dangerous, Gale said. It's too dangerous alone that first Rachne nearly bested all of us together. We are more experienced this time, Gail insisted, buckling her baldric. Caitlin, we need you here. Help the Morvant rebuild, or they will forever be a ruined people, Adamantus said. Caitlin had turned and walked away at that point, determined to give both Gail and the Elk nothing but silence until they departed. She had followed through on that intention, but it did not take long for her to regret her choice. What if those were the last words she'd exchanged with them? Adamantus was her friend, and Gail... Well, Gail was something, even if Caitlin did not have a word for it yet. The uncertainty of their fates burned in her chest, and each afternoon she climbed up to the bluffs overlooking the village and the grassy steps beyond, hoping to catch sight of Adamantus, even Gail, returning, safe. A week had passed without a sign. Talia accompanied her each day, her presence soothing to Caitlin. The two of them had become nearly inseparable, Caitlin helping Talia learn to read, and Talia teaching Caitlin the customs of the Morvant, at least when they both were not sitting on the bluffs, waiting for news, waiting for change. Help rebuild, Adamantus had told her. It was a circumstance Caitlin could never have anticipated, helping their former enemy in their own lands. It did bring to mind one of Val's expressions, however. The best way to stop an enemy is to make him a friend. Friends Caitlin had made, but her success helping the Morvant rebuild had been limited. With so many of the tribe's people dead, missing, or migrated, those left in the village were weak and crestfallen, the spark gone from them. After the destruction of the Revenant, there had been muted celebration, but the same oppressive sense of loss and despair soon returned. After all, their lost chief had been found dead. Caitlin scanned the clouds for Soot's black shape. Gale had sent him back to Kareth, to Dared, with the imperative to confiscate the moonstone from King Oeon before it was too late. Another mission, another loose end for Caitlin to wait on, passively, helplessly. It was no wonder she gravitated to the windy outcrop each afternoon. It was a break from the gloom of the village. After so many months of doing, the tedium of waiting was unbearable. She imagined Talia accompanied her for the same reasons. By midday, after their morning chores were finished, a restlessness stirred in both of them. While the rest of the Morvant settled down to pass the sad and empty afternoon in desultory silence, neither could sit still, nor could they concentrate on reading lessons or doing any other tasks for that matter. The bluffs called to them. Staring does not cause the seed to sprout, Talia said as the wind flattened her hair across her face, painted this day with the barest of touches, an inverted blue V on one cheek and red one on the opposite. Caitlin took the simpler choices of face paint to be a sort of mourning sign her friend had adopted since returning to her homeland. Funny, Caitlin said, driving her hands deeper into her pockets, her eyes unfocusing. We have a similar expression. A watched kettle does not boil. The wind gusted between them and hissed in the grasses. Sapphire hopped from one stone to another, her tail feathers ruffled. 
After a long moment, Talia said, They will be back. I hope, Caitlin said. She turned her gaze to the path just below them. A figure on crutches was trudging up the slope, with speed that belied his misshapen leg. Joggin is coming, Caitlin said, but she did not move to meet him. One thing she had learned in her time in the Morvant village was that Joggin took satisfaction in climbing the slopes above the village, undeterred as he was by his crutches. He was panting, his cheeks flushed when he reached them. He offered greetings in the Morvant language, which Caitlin was able to understand and respond to, but the rest of his message was still incomprehensible to her. Talia, however, rose, brushing the seed paws and chaff from her skirt, her expression grave. Come, Caitlin, they found a carrier pigeon, with news from your people. Mine? Yes, maybe things are, finally, happening. The villagers were gathered in the hut of one of the elders, Gumri, whose son Alzad had come across the pigeon while hunting. It was a brown-gray bird with splotches of white on its neck. Alzad explained that he had been ready to capture and kill it for food, until he saw the message, a tiny piece of scroll wrapped around its leg. He handed the scrap to Caitlin. Sure enough, its letters were in the script of Anthor, unreadable to most of the Morvant, but recognizable to her. She read the words aloud, Talia translating for the waiting Morvant. To our sister kingdom of Kareth, a plea for help. Antis City has been overrun by creatures from the Dark Wood. Help is requested to save us from the monsters. Send word to our king. Caitlin read and reread the writing, cursing the scrap for its small size and the brevity of its message. It left her with more questions than answers, but her fear quickly filled in the gaps. The creatures could only be the Vorgs. Had the monsters ventured north out of revenge for the attack Caitlin and her friends had delivered on them? It seemed that not even the Anton Council, who would have sent the message, had knowledge of King Talamar's death. Had other pigeons been sent? Would Oeon be in any state to answer, to respond, or was he still in thrall of the Moonstone, on his way to becoming a revenant himself? Was her family safe? Caitlin thought of her aunt and uncle, her cousins, Jessamy and Maxwell. I have to go, she said, dropping the message and running out of the long hut. The villagers remained in stunned silence, except for Talia, who followed her to their own small hut where they kept their belongings. Caitlin was already rolling up her sleeping mat when Talia caught up with her. Without word, her companion began to pack her own things. What are you doing? Caitlin asked. I shall come with you, she said, her stare level, a satchel in her arms. You have to stay here. Wait for Adamantus and Gail. There is nothing for me here, Talia said, her voice low as she rubbed the corner of her eyes with her fist. Caitlin picked up the short sword she had carried since their time with Pathus. It could be dangerous. I think I know the creatures that have invaded our lands. They are living nightmares. But I have to reach my family, to see if they are safe. I can fight, Talia said. The memory of her fierce expression as she had challenged the Rachne at the lake's edge came to Caitlin's mind. You're right. You can. Help me prepare the horses. So expansive were these big sky lands that oftentimes, in a sweep from one horizon to the other, one could witness all varieties of weather. Slanting slopes of rain draining from clouds, patches of brassy sunlight, rainbows slung over rainbows in between, and of course there was always the wind. It blew down from the dragon's teeth of the rim curs, setting all things in constant motion, Grasses, hair, hems, saddle straps, and horses' manes. After a few days of riding, however, the wind died down. The rim curves were softened by distance, and the empty steps gave way to the river lands of eastern Kareth. Caitlin and Talia rode along branching tributaries and around isolated elbow lakes. Finally, 
As trees reappeared, they had wood for fires and cover from view. It was a mixed blessing in all, because despite their progress westward, Caitlin did not know what to expect in these borderlands between Carith and Antist the North. They saw a few bands of refugees and fewer soldiers. After reports of creatures emerging from Sidon, Caitlin did not know what else they might encounter. As two young women without an escort, she knew it was best they avoided being seen. Caitlin kept her sword and spear handy, but was not sure what use weapons would be if they were overpowered, outnumbered, or both. Although knowing what she knew of Talia, Caitlin was certain they would not go down without a fight. Her Morvant companion had put on weight since returning home. The sunken hollows were gone from her cheeks, replaced by a more attractive roundness. But Talia was far from preoccupied with her appearance. She kept her hair pulled back, except for a few short strands she kept feathered out to the side. Today, she wore two streaks of white, with red in between on each cheek. Something about how she kept her clothes belted close to her body with her baldric, crisscrossed with the strap of her quiver, reminded Caitlin of Gale, even Chloe. Their journey continued. Caitlin's mind was restless with thoughts of her family during the day, and occasionally disturbed by nightmares at night. The skies they slept beneath held stars that were bright and piercing, like the winter air that had taken on a sharp edge. They slept close to the fire when they felt safe enough to build one. Otherwise, they spooned together for warmth, Talia placing an arm around Caitlin when she woke from night terrors, Caitlin doing the same when Talia shook and wept at night for her family. It was after one particularly cold night that they were roused by the sounds of voices. Caitlin moved slowly, stiff from the cold and sleep. Talia bore no signs of such lethargy, leaping to her feet and reaching for her bow and quiver, but it was too late. The party had already spotted their horses, and half a dozen men converged on their camp. They were Morvant. Caitlin knew this with certainty after having lived among them. They recognized Talia as one of their own, and spoke to her in their language, Caitlin only catching fleeting words and meanings. But from the way Talia closed ranks with her and kept her arrow knocked back on her bowstring, Caitlin did not take their visitors to be friendly. The men, wrapped in cloaks and furs, their breath forming clouds about their heads who had found them, called to the rest of the party. At first, Caitlin was encouraged to see women among their numbers, but these women's expressions were hard and unforgiving. One pointed at the antler knife from the rachne that Caitlin had stuffed under her belt and mumbled the Morvant word for killer. When their leader stepped into their midst, Caitlin understood why. The others she had not recognized, but the chief, this man with dark, inky pools for eyes, his sulfur-yellow cloak clasped at his shoulder with a bone buckle, she remembered. He was the same man who had stared at her with such animus at the lake shore when they had killed the Rachne. These are those that worship the Rachne, Caitlin said. Yes, the Candley, and they remember us. Not fondly, Caitlin thought. They know you are Morvant? It does not matter. We killed their master. And they intended to kill them as well. That was clear to Caitlin. The chief gave a signal and the others closed in for the attack. Talia let fly an arrow and struck a man in the shoulder, but there were too many of them. The resistance, although fierce, was quashed quickly, and soon they were both pinned down. Without other means, Caitlin cried out for help, her voice echoing like a ghost among the trees. There was no one to answer. But for good measure, the candle tore a strip of her sleeve and stuffed it into her mouth. The chief gave another order, and Talia protested with a stream of incomprehensible words, her face pale. But she moved no one, not even the women, who began to gather firewood and stack it in a pyre. No, Caitlin said. Talia met her gaze for the briefest of moments. I am asking that they spare you. No, both of us. Spare both of us. 
Talia shook her head as an old woman, her mouth puckered in a frown, dumped a bushel of branches onto the pile. It's no use. They want to punish us for the sake of their god. Your god is false. It was just an animal, a twisted creation, Caitlin cried out, even though she knew her words were useless. The men found a log and, using their axes, chopped its end to a point and drove it into the ground so that it stood upright in the pyre. Using rope from Caitlin and Talia's own saddlebags, they tied them to the log and continued to pile wood. Caitlin's bladder suddenly felt full to exploding and ready to burst when two of the men started to rub two sticks together to create a flame. Caitlin, I'm so sorry, Talia said. Her face turned close to Caitlin's. Caitlin reached her fingers out and locked them with her friend, words failing her completely for a response. The firewood was piled up to their knees now. It was only for the others to wait now. Caitlin knew she was crying. She could not help it. She knew her words, her pleas for mercy were lost, even the ones she spoke in the Morvant's own tongue. The women, the men most of all, the leader in the sulfur-colored cloak, watched with soulless eyes. Caitlin had heard of women being ravished, and that they had survived the ordeal by imagining themselves somewhere else, a place of peace, a moment of happiness, a childhood day playing games in the garden, resting in a mother or father's arms. She reached into her mind for memories of her family, remembering meals with her cousins, her aunt and uncle, the glow of laughter and the love in their tiny house on the fringes of the city. Would she be able to hold on to that memory, those feelings, even as the flames licked her flesh, scorched her hair, and blistered her skin? Don't cry, Talia said. Don't cry. Caitlin tried to compose herself, tried to summon the courage she had seen in Gail, in Talia, in Chloe, even in herself when she had faced the Vorgs. But even that was not as terrible as this. Then she had been free to move, to fight, not a helpless victim, immobile, impotent. The men sparked a flame with the sticks, blew on it, and fed it strips of bark. The flame kindled. They handed it to their leader. Not like this. Not like this. She was thinking it. Then she was saying it, her fear turning to pleading as she clutched Talia's fingers painfully with her own. Something warm was running down her leg. As the chief stepped closer, her breaths became shorter, her chest fighting against the ropes. Talia spat. It was fruitless, but the symbolism meant something. Caitlin's own mouth was too dry, but she noted with satisfaction that Talia had struck true. The chief reached up to wipe his face with the corner of his cloak, the color of bile. Finished, he dropped it back down, the hem flapping close to his knees, Caitlin wishing it would catch fire and he would be immolated with them. There was no such twist, no such turn of luck. He stepped forward into the pyre, kindling snapping beneath his footsteps. His eyes locked on Caitlin's, eyes that were pitiless and already aflame with the fanaticism born of cults formed in times of destitution. The wood crackled around her. She could already feel the heat. As the chief began to move his eyes away back to his followers, there was a soft thud, like a whip striking a hollow pumpkin. His lips parted, and he dropped the burning brand completely, the flames roaring up to engulf all three of them. Still, he did not flee. Instead, he leaned towards Caitlin, his lips parted, flecked with spittle and blood. He put his hand on the center pole next to Caitlin as if to balance himself. His eyes were now wide and lidless. With a grunt, he fell into the very flames he had fed, an arrow with red fletching sticking out of his back. Chapter 11 Black Tea Gregor had always felt the throne, his throne, to be an ill fit. Gregor Lachnor, the last great leader of the Servoir, had been an imposing man, so to his throne, with its high arms and deep seat and a back that rose much higher than Gregor's own head did now. At fourteen, unless he came into a sudden spurt of growth, it was becoming obvious that this reincarnated version of the great Servoir leader 
would not be the same size as he had been in his previous life. This was a wrinkle his master had not foreseen, but Gregor continued with the charade. What choice had he? He kept his face impassive, as Felix shared the business of the day with his small court of advisors, lackeys, and sycophants, all of them with their own faces blank and expectant, as they studied Gregor for sign of pleasure or displeasure, and took their cue from that. But right now he was bored with the reporting, the reading of their amount of stores, the sharing of lesson plans for the novices, the noting of the students who were excelling and those who appeared to be weak in their resolve to continue. Gregor was always secretly relieved when students left, either out of failure or when their novitiates were completed. Failure actually meant they were likely too human, too soft, too kind for the servar's nefarious business. A sort of triumph in Gregor's eyes, at least for those lucky enough to be expelled. They never saw it that way, but perhaps with time, they would. The successful students were more of a threat. Most were older than he by the time they matriculated, and he always feared them finding him out. He had only been able to stay ahead of their powers with his own raw gifts, as well as the personal training he received from his master through the Revenant. But such illusions cannot last forever. Finally, they came to the business of the slave insurrection. All forty-eight slaves are now accounted for. Those who tried to escape by swimming have been retrieved. Those that rebelled shall be punished with minimal rations of water and no food for three days. Then they shall receive twenty lashes, Felix announced. Make it ten, Lord Felix. We need them healed quickly, so they can repair the seawall. Your counsel is wise, your eminence, Felix said with a bow. The other counselors nodded in eager agreement. That brings us to our last item of business, Felix said, clearing his throat. Your, uh, new manservant. Gregor sat up, turning his eyes but not his head, as a young man, perhaps a year or two his senior, was escorted into the throne room. They had dressed him in the plain brown wool uniform of a first-year novice, except without a sash that denoted his cloister. Instead of a leather belt, they had singed his trousers up with a piece of rope, wrapped around his narrow waist. Gregor was hopeful. The manservant's eyes were intelligent and alert, voting well for what he needed. An assistant who could anticipate what he needed and a slave to save him the headache of worrying about simple chores. On a closer look, Gregor could see that the slave's eyes were hazel, with flecks of red like flames of an eclipsed sun. His cheekbones were well-defined, perhaps overly so, his cheeks sunken from starvation. His chin was scarred from what appeared to be more than a couple of fights, and if it were not for his frizzled hair, washed clean of lice, he might have been handsome. Gregor had no doubt this was the same slave he had seen collapse on the deck of the ship during the insurrection. You will find that he knows his letters and can write them as well, Felix said. He escaped punishment because he did not participate in the rebellion. Could not, Gregor corrected. What condition do you have, slave? he asked speaking not as one peer to another, but rather as an adult might a child. The shaking sickness, the manservant said. One of his advisors gasped and made a sign to avert evil. He was an old man with untrimmed whiskers growing from his ears and nose. Your eminence, we cannot risk your health, he began to say while covering his mouth. The shaking sickness is not contagious, you old fool. Gregor said with a dismissive wave of his hand. He will do. If there is no other business, we are adjourned. Felix shook his head to signal there was none, so Gregor rose to his feet and beckoned for the new manservant to follow him. From then onward, the new slave attended to him throughout the day. Indeed, he was responsive, quick, and adequate at anticipating Gregor's needs. It was almost as if he had been trained before. His penmanship was legible, and he could take notes quickly as Gregor dictated. 
He said little and asked no more questions than were necessary. But it was clear from his ever-present look of sadness that his thoughts wandered, and his feelings were dark. Gregor knew slaves could be that way at first, and knew that in time the manservant would come to appreciate his lot. He certainly was better off serving in the castle than building the seawall. Half of those slaves would be dead in three months' time. The weeks rolled by. The sea's pewter face matched the sky, an unchanging view that Gregor grew weary of. They ordered extra shipments of coal from the mainland to keep the chambers warm, the chimneys of Drowstrom constantly pouring out clouds of black smoke. Gregor inspected classes, supervised construction of the seawall, had meetings with Felix, and in his private time, studied enchantments and his own books, or those his master showed him in their secret meetings in the North Wing. These were fewer this season, as his master was busy with other affairs, and possessed the body of the revenant only rarely. When he was present, Gregor tentatively reached into his mind and caught glimpses of crowded council chambers, long lines of refugees filling roadways, and rank upon rank of soldiers, even slaves. Sometimes he would see things he could not explain, hideous creatures with slitted eyes and needle-like teeth, babies ripped from their mother's breasts and smashed in bloody puddles, gallows, gallows and more gallows, with hanging, misshapen bodies. But if his master suspected Gregor of glimpsing these things when he was present in the Revenant, he did not betray it. His concerns centered on keeping Gregor trained, his powers more advanced than the novices, and diverting Felix's attention, the advisor growing more independent each day. Gregor knew himself to be under suspicion, the illusion, their story, growing frayed at the edges. When the winter storms clear, perhaps Felix can be sent on a sea voyage, an assignment to distant lands, Gregor suggested to his master. Agreed, said the husky voice that emanated from the dead warrior's lungs. Then, abruptly, Gregor felt his master's thoughts shift. It was like a cloud passing before the sun, leaving him in shadow. I am needed elsewhere. The body stiffened in its seat, and Gregor's master was gone. He felt the loss of time with his master as an actual hollow in his chest. Their sessions were the only times Gregor could be himself, when he was comfortable being a student. Otherwise, the role of Gregor twice born was a burden. It made him irritable and short with everyone else. Anger could cloud judgment, anxiety perception. He knew it was not a good state to be in. So Gregor tried to distract himself in studies, bearing down on his folios, books, and scrolls. For this reason, his temper flared when his new manservant brought him cream for his tea, placed the cup on the edge of the table, then let it fall, smashing into the floor, splattering a star of white liquid on the floor. The cat immediately scampered across the room and began licking at the puddle. The manservant attempted to shoo it away, but Gregor snapped, Don't bother. Someone should enjoy the milk. My apologies, my lord. Being forced to play a role, Gregor knew a performance when he saw one. But why his slave showed relief rather than trepidation piqued his curiosity. He had known the manservant for weeks now. He had observed him, and he was not clumsy. This drop did not appear inadvertent, but rather calculated. Clean it up. I'll have my tea black. Yes, my lord. Gregor sipped the bitter tea, turning his thoughts back to the spells before him. He was marginally aware of the clicking of the cat's tongue, then the return of the servant with a rag to clean up the spilled cream. The door opened, a draft blew on his feet, then closed again, the draft cut off. He practiced pronouncing the words under his breath, then willed them to appear in his mind so he could conjure them without speaking them. The true sign of an archmage, as he was supposed to be as a man, reincarnated with a lifetime of memories and experiences. When he was satisfied he had the words memorized, 
he rewarded himself with a sip of tea. It was still warm, and its heat was welcome in his chest, as he listened to the wind toss spray up against the castle walls. His thoughts drifted to the elements of nature, the passage of time, and how no matter how many times they rebuilt the sea walls, some day Drahlstrom would fall, crumbling into the sea under the waves. Another sound cut through his thoughts. The bells were pealing in the courtyard. Time for instruction. He drained the cup, closed the folio, pushed off his chair, only to freeze in place. The cat was sprawled on its side, as if stretched out for a long nap, but from the pink-tinged foam at his mouth he knew better. It was dead. Chapter 12 Of Slaves and Masters Gregor ate his midday meal in the north wing, biscuits and honey cakes he took from the students' hall, items that were not meant for him. He left instructions for his manservant to come to him in his private chambers, the first time Gregor had allowed anyone there. The manservant would have no way of knowing which door led to Gregor's chamber, so Gregor got up from his table and ventured into the hall. Sure enough, the manservant was there, tray in hand, checking each door along the corridor. I'm here, Gregor said. Come. Gregor studied him as he moved down the hall, his footsteps light, nimble even. When his servant was just before him, Gregor tossed him a hard-boiled egg from his pocket. Quick to react, the servant shifted his weight, held the tray with one hand, and caught the egg with the other. Intriguing. Follow me, Gregor said, turning into his chamber. The room was dark, the shutters closed against the afternoon gale, the drafts causing the flames of the candles to tremble above their wicks. Please, set the tray down on that table. The manservant obeyed, then brought his hands together before him, his eyes focused on the space between himself and Gregor. The cat is dead, Gregor said. My condolences. I'm no fool. The milk was poisoned. The only reason you are standing there alive is because I think you knew. His eyes met Gregor's. This was not the stare of a beaten and broken servant. These eyes were self-possessed. Speak freely, Gregor said. I knew. Gregor leaned back against the table. What is your name? Derek. That is a lie. Take it from one who is a liar. What is your true name? Hale. Gregor wondered if the name should mean something to him. He did not want to betray ignorance if this young man was indeed someone he should know. How did you know, Hale? I saw Felix put the poison in the cream. You are his co-conspirator, then. Why do you choose to betray him? I am not. He does not know I saw him. So you are perceptive and discreet. You are also a slave. What obligation do you have to me, who enslaved you? Someone once told me, all life is precious, even the enemies. Am I your enemy? If you are not, then perhaps you are my ally, and that is better than a master. Careful you do not forget yourself. You said speak freely, Hale said, holding his stare. Gregor winced. Hale was right. Gregor changed tack. It was time to knock this servant back on his heels. You know your letters. You speak as one who has been educated. I don't imagine this is a life you ever envisioned for yourself. Is that why you always look so forlorn? It is difficult being something you are not. Don't I know? You don't think of yourself as a slave? I thought much more highly of myself before. A noble from your upbringing. A hero for my deeds. A good son for my love. Instead, I am this. He dropped his gaze and he offered up his palms. Something in his disposition moved Gregor. This candor, this conversation as themselves, as if the shutters had been thrown open and sunlight and fresh air were streaming in, 
chasing away shadows, melting away the shapes of things as they were not. No facades, no characters to play. I am not reincarnated. Hale looked up now, his face a question. I am a fraud, a slave myself, to a master who is distant, who keeps himself hidden, and the order of the serve war deceived. Why, I don't know. He is powerful, so powerful. Mystery adds to his power. That must be his intention. Who is he? Not even I know his name. He took me from my own family when I was just a child. Already it was clear I had the gift in a powerful way. He took my family, my home, my identity. Gregor heard surprising bitterness in his voice as the truth flooded out in a gush. He gave me this role to play, Gregor twice born, the last great master of the Servor reincarnated, their chief who conquered even death. But why? To conquer death is the Servor's greatest goal. Lochnor was their most powerful leader in generations, so I'm told. He had been obsessed with finding a way to come back after death. My own master knew this. Your master served him. My master killed him, but not to make himself vulnerable. So he put me in his place, a puppet, to control the order for him and protect himself. Why are you telling me? Do you intend to kill me? No, I tell you because the order is growing suspicious. At least Felix is. I'm in danger. Meanwhile, my master is preoccupied. I'm alone. I need an ally of my own. In appearance, Gregor and Hale remained master and servant. But alone, as the weeks passed, they were closer to equals, one's survival dependent on the other. Hale made himself indispensable in the kitchen, where he befriended the cooks and could watch Gregor's food being prepared. He also was able to procure items directly from the stores, where he knew them to be free of tampering. Gregor, knowing how reliant he was on Hale, shared with him his luxuries when he could, inviting him to dine with him at the same table in his chambers. Hale was reticent about his past and his identity before coming to the island. Most days he hovered somewhere between brooding despair and shameful melancholy. But sharing food had some curative effect on his outward appearance. The hollows filled beneath his eyes, and he lost his lean, withered look. After dinner one evening, when the early winter sun had set, leaving just a purple ribbon on the horizon, Gregor was feeling particularly melancholy himself. It had been weeks since he had had an audience with his master. The revenant had been still and inert as a statue. Gregor could only guess at what urgent affairs were keeping his master so occupied. He stared out into the gloaming sky, framed by the window sill, before turning to Hale, who appeared to be lost in his own thoughts, the darkness deepening in the room about them. Play a game of drafts with me, Gregor said. Very well, Hale said, not looking up from his own empty plate scattered with crumbs and streaks of grease. At times, Gregor worried that he would lose his only ally to Hale's private mourning. It felt like an untenable situation, and, for the moment, reaching out to his glum companion was paramount to him. He cleared away the plates himself, opened the lid to the draughts box, and set the board and pieces on the table between them. In the darkness, the pieces were nearly indistinguishable. Without much effort, Gregor snapped his fingers and conjured flames on the candles throughout the room, so that they were bathed in warm light. The twitch on Hale's face did not escape his notice. Are you in pain? Gregor asked. Hale shook himself as if to ward off a chill. Just a passing headache is all, he said. Are you sure? Gregor asked. Then, instead of arranging the pieces on the board by hand, he focused his energies to lift them out of their holders and set them in their places. He moved a few pieces through the air, passing them close to Hale's shoulder. He had not imagined it. Hale clenched his eyes shut, as if in discomfort. You have the gift, 
Gregor said. When Hale did not reply, he clarified. You can perform magic. You are sensitive to my enchantments. Hale kept his mouth in a thin line, his eyes cast downward as he rubbed his temples. You can't hide it. You need not. How long have you known? A few months. It was a recent discovery. But how can you tell? Those who are sensitive sometimes feel a secondary effect from the enchantments of others until they know how to put their own boundaries in place, Gregor said, leaning forward in his chair and placing his hands flat on the table. This is a stroke of luck. I can train you. By the stars, what other secrets are you hiding from me? Hale shook his head, staring at the pieces on the board. The first time I saw someone make a flame appear, it felt like this tingling all over my skull. That is it. Gregor feared he had misspoken, for Hale looked to the window, the muscle in his jaw flexing as if to hold back some expression of emotion. I only meant you have talents, latent power. I understand, Hale said quickly. It would help us both if I could develop you in this way. Magic has always come easily to me. Hale pushed out his chair, stood, and walked to the window. To what end? You have shown me mercy, but this existence cannot last, especially if your own illusion is growing threadbare and your own people are turning against you. Gregor crossed his arms over his stomach, which suddenly felt unsettled. I have thought the same this very night. We are allies, but we are both still prisoners, so to speak. Soon my master will be sure to contact me. He, he, you serve an order devoted to darkness. What does it mean that I am helping you now? Hale said, leaning his hands on the windowsill. You wish to leave? Hale shook his head. I'm not sure where I belong anymore. But neither of us is safe here. Gregor was captivated by one of the candle flames for a moment. My master has always taught me that the world is a wicked, chaotic place, overrun with fools and imbeciles that require order, power, control. Otherwise, the forces of disorder will reign. Who is your master? I've said before, even I don't know for certain. But the visions I see when I communicate with him... He stopped running his palms across his face. What is the world, Hale? A good or bad place? It's just a place, in my experience. Gregor did not know if he was comforted by the answer. He was not sure which answer he had wanted. If it were bad, his master would have been justified in his bids for control and conquest. But that was not a world Gregor wanted to live in. If it was a good place... Then what did that make his master, much less him? I'd like to see it again, for myself, he heard himself say. You'd like to get off this rock? Yes, I would. Hale turned back to him. Then we both will need to learn from each other. Teach me to use magic. Done. What will I learn from you? Do you know how to use a sword? Gregor was caught off guard and slightly embarrassed, no, I have never needed to. My talents lie elsewhere. We'll change that. We'll need to if we're going to escape. <laughs>